this is Miss Litton, and this is my wonderful period four honors biologist. Say hi. Hi. You say the same thing every time. <laughs> and so I want to just, just touch base. You had some experience when I was gone last class with cladograms, and I just want to touch base on those again. And again, cladograms are all about looking at the phylogeny, the evolutionary history of organisms. And when you put organisms, when you arrange them, you can look at things like structural, chromosomal, um, or currently, right now, molecular evidence is the thing to look at. To teach a cladogram, I like to introduce it with structural things because you can relate to that better than if I tell you how many differences there are analyzing amino acids, though you had an opportunity to do that. So I want to start by looking at this chart right here. Okay, and let's decide what traits, do, which, which traits do they have? So for instance, um, a fish, does a fish have a backbone? Yes. yes. Okay, does he have, hello, does he have lungs? No. Any of these other things? No. How about a salamander? Has lungs and a backbone. Backbone and lungs, does he have any of this? I bet you can see a, a pattern. pattern. How about the lizards? Yes, yes. first three. Yes. First three, huh. Okay, and how about the mouse? Yes, first yes, four. yes. First four, a, right, and then the human. Are you all right? So we could take this information, let me dual page you here just for a minute. Why, oh no. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's apply that to this cladogram. Okay, so discuss with your bio buddy, here are those same traits. How would you set this up on a cladogram and who would come first, second, third, fourth? Discuss with bio buddy, go. The first thing would be back and then you put fish, and then you put lungs, I don't know you any of the notes on that. I gave you everything. We need characters. The B. Okay. Little I and little I. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Did you do it? Okay. Let's um, let's let's work off one page here. So what would you put on the bottom? Like all of them share this in common. What trait? Backbone. Backbone. So they all have backbone. Then what's the next one they all have? Lungs. Okay, but who doesn't have a lung? Fish. Okay, so we'll stick him right here. What's the next trait you would pick? Claws. Claws, claws okay. But who doesn't have claws? Salamander. Okay, so we will put him here. Not drawn to scale. Okay, what's the next thing we would pick? Hair. Hair. But who doesn't have it? Lizard. Lizard. So he gets dropped off. Okay. But they have some things in common, right? Yeah. What do they have in common? Yeah. Right. So somewhere here is their common ancestor, right? Somewhere here that they that they all evolved from, right? Because they all have the backbone. Okay, what's the next thing we're gonna put? Opposable thumb. thumb. Okay, and where do, who we're gonna put there? Mouse. Mouse. Okay. And who we're gonna put next? Okay. But who's who's dropping off? Okay, and here. So if I ask you, did man evolve from an ape, you would say no. no. But do they share a common ancestor? Yes. Yes, okay. So here's where their common ancestor <coughs> is, but this is a derived trait, being bipedal. Okay, along this clad, they have common ancestors. So if I was looking for the common ancestor of the mouse, the ape, and the human, then I'm going to go back somewhere here. You with me? Okay. So when we do this now, it's not so much those physical characters that you look at, but you look at sequences of amino acids in proteins. You look at sequences of bases in DNA. Okay. And that's how you set up um, your phylogenetic tree, by making those types of comparisons. And the idea is the more similar the amino acids, the more similar the DNA, the more closely related. So what I what I would owe you underneath cladogram is it reflects, oh, I already gave you that, just B. 
characters. Ancestral characters are those that are found within the entire line of descent of a group of organisms. They're found within the entire line of descent. And then um, little number two there, derived characters are those that are present in members of one group of the line, but not in the common ancestor. But not in the common ancestor. All right, now let's take a look at this. And oldest bio buddy, could you please explain why would this frog be this color? <coughs> Go ahead. Okay, any ideas? Why is this frog this color? Yes. Hey, I'm poisonous. So he's advertising his his poisonousness, right? He's hoping that the bird or the snake learned on a cousin or a brother, right? With that same adapta adaptations, the blue ones make you sick. Now, let's think about traits we have that have to do with color. What are some traits we have that has to do with color? Um, is our, I think um, isn't our um, I think our eyes. Okay, let's go right there. Eye color. Now, when we did genetics, we have other things that are colors, but our eyes have colors, right? When we did genetics, do you remember the alleles we looked at that coded for eye color? What were they? What alleles did we use? Remember, those are alternate forms of a gene. Big B and little b. Now, I have blue eyes. Do you know my alleles? Yes. What are they? Little B, little B, little B, little B, because that's the only way, because blue eyes are what? Recessive. Recessive. So the only way I can have blue eyes if I'm little B, little B, right? If somebody has brown eyes, what could they be? Big B, big B, big B, big B or big B, big B, little B. Exactly, okay? Now, could we count up how many people have blue eyes and brown eyes in this room? Yes. yes. So we could figure out the frequency of blue and brown eyes, yes? And from that, you can derive the frequency of the allele that codes for that trait. Okay, what is the frequency of the little b allele in this room? What is the frequency of the big b allele in this room? We can predict that just based on the, um, the colors of eyes in this room, and we're going to get to that point in just a few minutes. However, this is what I wanna point out to you. Why would I look at allele frequency? And that's because evolution is when allele frequencies change over time. Evolution is when allele frequencies change over time. Why am I saying that? Because allele frequencies code for traits. I want you to think about the horse. What did we see in the horse evolution? How big was the horse originally? Small what? Like dog, right? And now it's bigger, yes? So would height, being pea plants, was height coded for by allele? Yes. What allele was selected for for the horse? The tall allele. Why would that be selected for? Why would that be better to be tall than short as their environment changed? Why would that be better? Yeah. So you could see predators. See predators. You could see predators that are gonna eat you, right? So you could get away, right? So that, that would be an adaptation. They move from being in a forest environment to grassland environment. So. The height allele, let's just make it real simple for horses and say it was big T and little t. As their environment changed, then what allele was selected for? The big T or the little t? Big T. Big t. When allele frequencies change, what has occurred? Evolution. Evolution. That's where we're going with today. We're just gonna kind of flesh that out a little bit more. So um, if you look here, okay, so evolution is a result of these four factors. You have potential to increase in your numbers. So just don't worry about filling in your notes yet. We'll do it in just a second. I want you to get it and then you'll be fine. Okay, so eyes are up here. So you had all these um, ancient horses and some of the ancient horses were really small, some were medium and some were what? Large. Let's say they had the space and they had the resources where they could increase in their numbers. Among the horse, the early horse, they had variations in their DNA. It wasn't a variation because somebody kicked them in the face and they had some sort of mutation. It was actually in their DNA that coded for their particular height. 
there is competition for resources. They wanted to survive and reproduce. That's what fitness is, is be able to pass on your genes. Who could compete better, the taller horses or the shorter horses? Taller horses could compete better. The best adapted wins the, that competition and survives to reproduce another day. So over time, if that gets repeated and repeated and repeated, the horse is gonna get taller and taller and taller. Could it ever get too tall? Yeah, do giraffes have long necks? Yes, could their necks ever be too long? Why would a giraffe even want a long neck? Yeah, because they can eat the, the tall trees and they can eat the lower branches, right? And a short giraffe can only eat off the lower. But your neck could be so tall that your heart has to work so hard to get the blood all the way up there. Your blood pressure could drop when you're getting a drink, eat, get a drink of water. It could be too difficult. So there, you don't want to go too tall. You want it to be selected for where it's just right. Okay? And all of those traits are governed by the alleles. So when we say we're selecting traits that are more adaptive, we're really selecting what that's more adaptive? Alleles. And when allele frequencies change, what is occurring? Evolution. Evolution. Right, evolution is occurring. So on your notes, let's go look at our notes. Evolution is about a change in traits that's governed by what? What is it governed by? Alleles in a population which is a group of a single species living together in the same geographic area. Specifically, the change in allele frequencies in a population over time, over time. So this results from four factors. First of all, the potential for a species to increase in number. The potential for a species to increase in number. And then beta person, the heritable genetic variation genetic variation of individuals in a species due to a mutation and sexual reproduction. So what gave them their variation? Some were taller than others. Maybe it was a mutation. Maybe it was through sexual reproduction. C, competition for limited resources. Competition for limited resources. And D, the proliferation of those organisms that are better able to survive and reproduce in the environment that are be better able to survive and reproduce in the environment. Now, those horses, when they're getting ready for horse reproduction, okay, as long as they're all still reproducing with each other, and there's changes within it, they're getting a little, some of them are a little bit taller, as long as they're still reproducing with each other, but they're just changes in their environment, that would be called microevolution because they're still all the same species. But if the tall horses only reproduce with other tall horses, and the short horses only reproduce with other short horses, over time they can become two different species, and what kind of evolution would that be? Macroevolution. Macro Macroevolution is when you form a whole new species. So let me give you an example of how that might work, how microevolution might work. Here are some moths, and this is the classic experiment for microevolution, and then I'm gonna show you a new one. Okay, so eyes up here you can see two species of moth, okay? Which one is more likely to get eaten? One right. Yeah, oh, did I say two species of moth? Yeah. I didn't mean to say that. Oh, I, I wanted to say, I wanted to say they're the same species, they're just two different colors. Just like we have brown eyes and blue eyes, some of them are black colored and some of them are tan colored. So they're just the same species though, same species. So the frequency of which allele do you think is higher? The tan allele frequency or the black allele frequency? Tan. 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 Why? Because less the black ones attacks. are getting what? Eaten because they show up. Now, following post-industrial revolution, now the trees look like this. What do you think is going to happen to the black allele frequency? It's going to go up. And the tan allele frequency is going to go down. But they're still the same species, so what kind of evolution is that? Microevolution, Micro because it's within the species. If the tan ones only have sex with tan ones and black ones only reproduce with black ones, then over time, then you're going to start to do what kind of evolution? Macroevolution. Macro so on your notes, go to your notes. Microevolution is within a population. 
within a population of macroevolution is large scale forming and finish that forming a new species. Now let me give you a more current example. This is a yellow bellied three toed skink. Okay, it's a lizard. Okay, a yellow, so it's a reptile. A yellow bellied three toed skink. This particular skink lives in where it's a little bit colder. And they have found that these yellow bellied three toed skinks tend to keep their embryos within, not lay eggs. So they're not laying their eggs, they're giving live birth. So they're coming slithering out of it. Her. <laughs> Sorry. Wow, that's really a big evolution. Okay, coming out of her. Okay. And those that live in still like warmer areas, they're still laying their eggs. Why would that be a good adaptation not to lay eggs and keep them inside in the colder temperatures? Yeah. So you don't want your egg to like freeze to death. You don't want your egg to freeze to death, right? So it's protecting them for a little bit longer. Now, these yellow bellied three toed skinks carrying these embryos within still mate with those who lay eggs but it's a variation within the species. This is called microevolution. But if the ones that give live birth end up only starting to mate with others that give live birth because they're more successful, and they don't ever give, don't mate with ones that still lay eggs, that would be called what? Macroevolution. Okay, so here are just a few more details on this in case you were wondering. So this is, um, scientists have recently caught microevolution in live action as they ob observed, this is an Australian lizard, and it made the evolutionary leap from laying eggs to giving birth. Individuals of the same species of lizard living in higher, colder regions have begun to gestate and give live birth while the rest of their species in lower, warmer regions continue to lay eggs. According to National Geographic, evolutionary records show that nearly 100 reptile lineages have independently made the transition from egg laying to live birth in the past, and today about 20% of all living snakes and lizards give birth to live young only. Okay, so you're seeing evolution right before your eyes, and eventually if they're saying, ah, only, I only mate with live birth ones, then that would be an example of formation of a new species and macroevolution. Okay, not it. Not it. Whoever is not it, Please explain what evolution is and differentiate between the two types. Okay, you get to decide who's doing it. What is evolution and differentiate between the two types? of evolution I want this to see this I will tell you by the end of today this will be so easy you will have no problem with it at all okay but you keep your hand available we're gonna watch it go ahead and close your books your Chromebooks and it's a it's a voice you know and you have heard before is it the um it's not me fingers of evolution. A thorough understanding of biology requires a thorough understanding of the process of evolution. Most people are familiar with the process of natural selection, however, this is just one of five processes that can result in evolution. Before we discuss all five of these processes, we should define evolution. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. But what is a gene pool? And for that matter, what is a gene? Before spending any more time on genetics, let us begin with a story. Imagine that a boat capsizes and 10 survivors swim to shore on a deserted island. They are never rescued and they form a new population that exists for thousands of years. 
Strangely enough, five of the survivors have red hair. Red hair is created when a person inherits two copies of the red gene from their parents. If you only have one copy of the gene, you won't have red hair. To make this easier, we will assume that the five non-redheads are not carriers of the gene. The initial frequency of the red hair gene is therefore 50%, or 10 of 20 total genes. These genes are the gene pool. The 20 different genes are like cards in a deck that keep getting reshuffled with each new generation. Sex is simply a reshuffling of the genetic deck. The cards are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The deck remains the same, 50% red. The genes are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The gene pool remains the same, 50% red. Even though the population may grow in size over time, the frequency should stay at about 50%. If this frequency ever varies, then evolution has occurred. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. Think about it in terms of the cards. If the frequency of the cards in the deck ever changes, evolution has occurred. There are five processes that can cause the frequency to change. To remember these processes, we will use the fingers on your hand, starting from the little finger and moving to the thumb. The little finger should remind you that the population can shrink. If the population shrinks, then chance can take over. For example, if only four individuals survive an epidemic, then their genes will represent the new gene pool. The next finger is the ring finger. This finger should remind you of mating because a ring represents a couple. If individuals choose a mate based on their appearance or location, the frequency may change. If redheaded individuals only mate with redheaded individuals, they could eventually form a new population. If no one ever mates with redheaded individuals, these genes could decrease. The next finger is the middle finger. The M in the middle finger should remind you of the M in the word mutation. If a new gene is added through mutation, it can affect the frequency. Imagine a gene mutation creates a new color of hair. This would obviously change the frequency in the gene pool. The pointer finger should remind you of movement. If new individuals flow into an area or immigrate, the frequency will change. If individuals flow out of an area or emigrate, then the frequency will change. In science, we refer to this movement as gene flow. All four of the processes represented by our fingers can cause evolution. Small population size, non-random mating, mutations, and gene flow. However, none of them lead to adaptation. Natural selection is the only process that creates organisms better adapted to their local environment. I use the thumb to remember this process. Nature votes thumbs up for adaptations that will do well in their environment and thumbs down to adaptations that will do poorly. The genes for individuals that are not adapted for their environment will gradually be replaced by those that are better adapted. Red hair is an example of one of these adaptations. Red hair is an advantage in the northern climates because the fair skin allowed ancestors to absorb more light and synthesize more vitamin D. Thumbs up. However, this was a disadvantage in the more southern climates where increased UV radiation led to cancer and decreased fertility. Thumbs down. Even the thumb itself is an adaptation form through the process of natural selection. The evolution that we have described is referred to as microevolution because it refers to a small change. However, this form of evolution may eventually lead to macroevolution or speciation. Every organism on the planet shares ancestry with a single common ancestor. All living organisms on the planet are connected back in time through the process of evolution. Take a look at your own hand. It's an engineering masterpiece that was created by the five processes I just described over millions and millions of years. Can you recall the five main causes of evolution from memory? If you can't, hit rewind and watch that part again. But if you can, give yourself or your neighbor a big five-fingered high five. Okay, okay. so what I want you to do... Okay, listen. What I want you to do is I want you to review that with your bio buddy. See, looking at your hand, can you come up with the five things that would cause evolution? Go.
come back to me. This is the part, if you get it in like the next five to 10 minutes, you're set for the whole section of this. So dial it in, take a breath in, let it out. Don't worry about your notes, but you're gonna wanna have a piece of paper and a calculator. Piece of paper, pen, and a calculator. If you don't have a calculator, I have some in the back there. You can use your phone, I don't care what you use. Makes no difference to me. All right, good to go? All right. Focus, focus, big breath, dial it in. My Mickey Mouse. Okay. So, first thing we need to know, we're going to look at some hogs, okay? They are all members of a population living in that area, and they are in a breed, okay? For these hogs, remember when we did our eye color differences? What were the two alleles we were looking at to code for eyes? Big B and little b, all right? So, let's look at our population, population of our hogs. How many hogs do we have? Count them. How many? Seven. We have seven hogs. How many alleles do we have for every trait we have? Two. Okay, now stop and look at me, just focus. We have two. I have, for me, you know both of mine are little b and little b. I could throw those into the gene pool. Every member in this classroom could take your two eye color alleles and throw them into the gene pool. Okay, and that's what we're gonna do right now. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hogs so how many alleles total do we have? 14. 14, because they each have two, right? Yeah. So we have 14 alleles total. Look at, don't, don't worry about what they threw in here, just look at the individual hogs, and with your bio buddy, find out how many of those alleles are the big B allele, and how many alleles are little b of the whole population. Two Discuss with bio buddy. Seven. How many big B's totally, if they threw all their alleles in the gene pool, how many do they have? Seven. Seven big B's. So seven out of 14. So if I was going to do some math there, I bet you don't need your calculator for this. What is seven divided by 14? 0. 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 big B's. Yes? 50% of all of the alleles in this population, 50% of all the total alleles are 0. 0.5. We all right? Okay. Because we know the only other allele is little b, I don't even have to count those. What do I know the little b, little b is going to be? 7 out of 14, and that's going to be what? 0.5. Because the number of big b's plus little b's is going to equal 1, because those are our only options, yes? yes. 0.5 plus 0.5 equals 1. All right, ask your bio buddies. Shadowlands or Sunshine so far? But there are other alleles out there, other letters besides b's, right? When we looked at pea plants for height, what letter did we use? T. T. Good. We looked at whether hair was straight or curly, right? We looked at the peas, whether they were round or wrinkled. Remember all of those? So what they like to do in population genetics is just ascribe a letter to the dominant allele and ascribe a letter to the recessive allele. And that letter that they use for the dominant allele, the letter you use is P. And the letter you use for the recessive allele is Q. So here we wrote B plus B equals 1. What would be another way to write that equation? P plus Q. P plus Q equals 1. Meaning, of all the alleles in our population, it's either going to be P or Q. In this case, either big B or little b. We all right so far? Okay. So we put all those alleles in our gene pool. And then the question is, what is going to come out? What kind of individuals can we get from that? So I'm going to go to a new page. We already have P plus Q equals 1. And we know P is the what? Give me that. That's the dominant what? Allele. Okay, and Q is the recessive allele. Now, let me just riddle me this. For me to have blue eyes... 
That's the recessive trait, right? What allele, speaking in the PQ language, what allele would I have to have? QQ. What would be another way to write QQ? Q squared. Q squared, right? Q squared would equal what trait? Recessive trait. What would equal the dominant trait? P squared or PQ. Okay, good. P squared or PQ, you would have a what? Dominant trait. To be homozygous dominant would be what? P. What would be homozygous dominant? P squared. What would be hetero dominant? PQ. Ask your Bob, but you got any problems with this? Okay, how could I write this as an equation? P squared plus, now let's think about this. I'm jumping ahead. Maybe you're not ready yet. Let's do this. Let's do, what is that? Punnett square. Now, when we did Punnett squares before, right, we were like crossing individuals. And we were saying, okay, what would you get if you cross this individual with this individual? Yes, you're right with that? Okay, now we're not crossing individuals, we're crossing everybody in the entire what? Population, in our, in our gene pool, exactly. So now when we set up our Punnett square, what's something I could put instead of big B, little b? I could put P and I could put Q. Right? And I could put P and I could put Q. Q. So what's P times P? P squared. P squared. What's this? P Q. P Q. What's this? P Q. And what's this? Q squared. Do you see another equation now? What would that equation read? Of all of our individuals here, I could write that as P squared plus 2P Q. 2P Q plus Q squared. Q squared equals 1. Look how I did that. I see, yeah. So we have two equations, okay? I have this equation, P squared plus 2, PQ plus Q squared equals 1, and P plus Q equals 1. Right? You see those two equations? What's the difference between them? The P plus Q equals 1 is the gene pool itself. The frequency of the dominant trait or the dominant allele and the recessive allele. That's my gene pool. What arises out of the gene pool, how it plays out in individuals, that's this equation right here. So let's practice that, okay? So we looked at those hogs and we said big B was 50%, right? And we said little b was 50%. Are, am I okay so far? Okay. So what's another word instead of big B and little b? Big so I could say P equals 0.5 and Q equals what? 0.5. Yes? So I can make a Punnett square. That's one way to do it. And so I could have P, Q, P, Q. And I could say P is 0.5, Q is 0.5, P is 0.5, Q is 0.5, right? What's 0.5 times 0.5? 0.25, and that's our P squared value, right? Again, what's 0.5 times 0.5? 0.25, and that's one of our PQs. But we have another one right here. 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. That's another PQ. And 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25, and that would be our what? Q squared. So when you have these values right here, I could just ask you, how many in this population do you think are homozygous dominant? You don't even have to write this all out. You would just say, oh, I think 0.5 times 0.5 is what? I think 25% of them are homozygous dominant. If this were a population of 100, or let's say 40, it's a population of 40 hogs, how many of those hogs do you think then would be homozygous dominant? 10. 10. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. How many would be homozygous recessive? 10. Ten. How many would be heterozygous? 20. 20. Okay? You got that all, okay, from just using those two equations. Now, let's try us. Let's apply this to us. Okay? So, same thing. 
If you are P squared, you are big B, big B, and you have what color eyes? Brown eyes. Brown eyes. If you are the two P Qs, you are what? Big B, little B, and you have brown eyes. If you are Q squared, you are what? Little B, little B, and you have what? Blue eyes. Well, the first thing we need to know is how many people are in this classroom? So do, are you going to count? I have 33. Do you have 33? Yeah. Okay, so we have we have 33 individuals in our population. Now, some of you have brown eyes, but I don't know what kind of brown you are, right? You could be big B, big B brown, or you could be what? Big B, little B. Big B, little B brown. The only ones I know for sure what their genotype is are the who? Blue eyes. So blue eyed people, please stand up. Just go with this straight up blue for right now. Because that's a modifier. Team. Okay, whoa, we're, we're, we're lots of blue eyes in here. So let's count how many blue eyes we have. One, two, three, four, five, I'm six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, do you get twelve? Did I count right? We got it? Got them all? So think about this. We just figured out what Q squared was. Q squared for us in this classroom is 12 out of 33 individuals. Do your math for me. Q squared, we said, represented in our Punnett square, the homozygous recessives. So what is 12 divided by 33? 36. Give me a number. 36. 0.36. Okay. So that's 0.36. Get only this. I want to solve for P. How can I possibly solve for P? By first solving for Q. How can I solve for Q? Okay, I know what Q squared is. Q squared is 0.36. If you were in math, how would you solve for Q? Square root it, right? So now I'm going to take the square root, right? Now I know what Q is. What is Q equal to? What is it? 0.6. How did I get Q? I found out the percentage of us who have the homozygous recessive trait, the percentage, and those represented in our Punnett square, the Q squared. So I just square rooted it. I know now, if all of us took, I'm predicting, I'm not 100% sure, I'm just predicting based on how many of us have blue eyes. We threw all of our letters in the gene pool. If I reached in that gene pool, 60% of the time, I would pull out a Q. Right? What do I also know? 40%. I pull out a P. If Q is 0.6, what did we already learn? P plus Q equals 1. Right? Those are the only two alleles, are big B and little b. So, what plus 0.6 equals 1? 0.4. So P must equal 0.4. Now, check with your bio buddy, Shadowlands or Sunshine. You ready? Can I make another step? Check with your bio buddy and really make sure they're ready before I take you to the next step. We're almost there. So you know where I'm going with this. Okay? We already said 36% of us Right? Let's go back to this, what we said before. Okay? To be, okay, the Q squared is the recessive trait. The P squareds plus two PQs, those are the what? Dominant trait. So now I want to know how many of us are homozygous dominant and how many of us are heterozygous dominant. So let, let's go back here. Where are we at? How could I find out? How could I predict? I know 36% of us have the blue eyes. How could I predict what percentage are brown eyes, homozygous dominant, or heterozygous? What do you want to do? Yes? Um, don't you have to uh, uh, square root 0.4? Not square root, but 
square, right? right? So I'm not, I'm not gonna find the square root. If P squared equals homozygous dominant, what is P? P is 0.4, right? So what would P squared equal be? Yeah, if P squared, I'm just gonna square this. 0.4 times 0.4 equals what? 0.16. What's the next step? 16% of us in here are homozygous dominant for brown eyes. What's 16% of our population size, which is 33? 0.16 times 33. 5.28. What is it? 5.28. 5.28. So people-wise, what is it probably? Five of you are homo based on how many of us have the recessive trait. It's predicted that five of you would be homozygous dominant. How could if I just wanted to do mathematically, how many heterozygotes do we have out there? That would be what? 2PQ. So that would be 2 times what's P? 0.4 times 0.6. What's 4 times 6? 4 times 6 is 0.24. I'm sorry, not what I've seen. Times 2 is 0.48. So 48% of you are heterozygotes. What's 48% of 33? What's 0.48 times 33? 16 point what? 15.84. 15.84, so 16 of you are probably heterozygotes. So from just knowing how many homozygous recessives in here, you could predict the rest of the genotypes of the people in the room. How does this relate to anything that we're doing? Hear me now. If that allele frequency changes, what is occurring? Evolution. Evolution. If the allele frequency for Q drops, to, uh, or let's say it rises, let's say it rises to 0.7, <coughs> what would P have to be then? 0 0.3. 0 0.3. If the allele frequency changes, evolution is occurring. Let's talk about what kinds of things could change that allele frequency. Small populations, right? Because they're more prone to genetic drift. What's the next thing? Non-random mating. Okay, if blue eyes became more valuable and everybody wanted to mate with blue-eyed people, that could increase the frequency of the blue-eyed trait, right? What's the next one? Mutation. Mutations. You could mutate to a different color, to that blue eyes. Blue eyes is a mutation. Maybe due to less ozone, we get more UV radiation that causes more of us to be blue eyed people. What about this one? Gene flow. Gene flow, okay? So if we have more blue eyed people moving into areas where they don't have blue eyed people, that's gonna increase the frequency of the blue eyed trait. And what's this one? Adaptation. If we were better adapted to our environment by having blue eyes and we could outcompete those that had brown eyes, that could increase the blue eyed frequency. If it changes us so much that blue eyed people only mate with other blue eyed people, then that would be what kind of evolution? Macro. Macro evolution. <coughs> but if blue eyed people still mate with brown eyed people, that would be called micro evolution. Youngest bio buddy, tell them what you've learned about allele frequencies. Go. Put it in your own words. How could you explain it? And you know what? I'm going to give you something to help you explain it. Use this. Use this to help yourself. Now, we are a small population. If we were stranded on that island, our initial gene frequency is much different than period uh, zero and period two. They were closer to 0 0.5, 0 0.5. They're like one class was 0.48 and 4Q. They were 0.48 and the other one was then 0.5, 
too, right? Between the two allele frequencies. And I think the other one was um, 0.46 or something like that. I mean, they were really close to 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So if we start our desert island with our gene frequency, we're already favoring the blue-eyed gene. Do you agree with me on that? Because we have more blue-eyed people in this room than I did in my other classes. That's why population size has a huge influence. That's called genetic drift. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But you're going to understand it because amongst our classes we were different. That initial gene frequency, it's called the founder's effect, can set you down a pathway. For instance, I can't wait, so I have to tell you this. You've heard of Amish people, yes? Yeah. Okay, so to re escape religious per persecution, they came here to the United States. But Amish people tend to marry other Amish. and have more Amish children, right? But the deal is this, the, the ones that settled, I think it's in Pennsylvania, in their group that settled, they had a six-fingered dwarf, okay? But men are scarce. It's not like they're like, I'm not going to have sex with a dwarf or marry the dwarf, you know? It wasn't like that. So that six-fingered dwarfism was in their initial gene frequency, and that's why amongst the Amish people in Pennsylvania, you see more dwarfism and more six-fingeredness. Because that, that's at a, a greater elevation, that frequency is higher than the general population because they only mated with other Amish people. You see that? Okay, that's a form of genetic drift. Why? Because they had a what? Small population. If you want to avoid evolution, if you want to avoid evolution, don't have a small population, have a large population. If you want to avoid evolution, don't have any, what was this one? Mutation. Don't have any mutation. Yes. So is that when like if you have to like marry like people in your family because if you have like a gene that goes too far into your kids and stuff like Yeah, that. you're more likely to pick up those recessive traits. Yeah. Now, here's how we're going to apply this, okay? This has to do with the Hardy Weinberg law or Hardy Hardy Weinberg principle. If you can freeze the allele frequencies, in our case at 0.6 and 0.4, then you prevent evolution. If you can freeze allele frequencies, you can prevent evolution. So we want to talk about what are the things that freeze allele frequencies so that they do not change. Well, the first thing you would have to do is you can't have any what? What do I have up here? Mutations. No mutations. If you can prevent mutations from happening, then you will freeze allele frequencies and no evolution will occur. So go to your notes. Am I a population genetics? Okay, population genetics is defined as the study of the changes, the study of the changes in the genetic makeup of a population. The study of the changes in the genetic makeup of a population in their gene pool, in their gene pool study of the changes in the genetic makeup of a population in their gene pool. Allele frequencies, gene pool, it's all the alleles in the population. Stay out of the shallow end. All the alleles in the population. Blue, take care of allele frequency. You have it all. Say it. Allele frequency. No. 2B. Okay, C. If the allele frequencies, I'm, I'm taking over now. If the allele frequencies for a particular trait remain unchanged, like what we're trying to do right now, then the P and Q values remain the same generation after generation, and that trait is not changing, gentlemen, not changing slash evolving. Not changing slash evolving, and it's said to be in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. You need to meet conditions in order not to change. What's the first condition I have up here that you need to meet? No, no mutations. No mutations. Here's another condition. No migration. Yeah, no migration, no gene flow. No gene flow. These are stingrays migrating. No migration or gene flow. No new traits migrating in, 
no new no traits migrating out no gene flow okay yeah you have to have a large population can you always have a large population no which one was that on the hand pinky which one was gene flow pointer okay just so you can remember them for a test okay another one is you have to have random reproduction it's funny because they're bugs <laughs> you have to have random reproduction. What finger was that? Ring finger, right? Okay, so do you think she, I'm assuming this is a female, okay? Do you think she said any bug will do? No, do you think she selected for which bug mated with her? Yeah, this is saying if you don't want the allele frequencies to change, if you want to freeze them, then you gotta have random reproduction. If you wanna keep it the same, that means we throw all our alleles in the gene pool and anybody can mate with anybody. We're not selecting for one trait over another. Okay, random reproduction. And then that's the last one is no selection. Now, what is on, What first of all, what is that? A cobra. Can you see the kind of coloring on the back of his like flaps right there? Yeah. What does it look like? A face. A face. Do you think that face was selected for over time? Yeah. Why would that be a good adaptation to have a face on the back of you? Scare the okay, so you could scare somebody who's coming up behind you. They might think you're watching them. Conversely, if they were trying to sneak up on you, where would they go? To the back of you. To the back, back of you, which is really the front of you, right? And you can bite them, okay? But if we're going to freeze allele frequencies, you can't select for that. Any cobra will do. But apparently the ones that survived and reproduced are the ones that had that face on them. So the conclusion is this. Oh, here are your equations. Do you see them in your notes? Okay. So if we look here, because we can't meet those conditions, because we can't avoid mutations, because not all of our populations are large, because not all of our matings are random, because we can't prevent gene flow, and because we can't prevent some traits being better than other traits, because we can't do that, then gene frequencies will in fact change. And if gene frequencies change, what is in fact occurring? Evolution. evolution. And if it changes and we're still the same species, what kind of evolution is it? Micro. If it changes so much that we're different species, it is macro. Have you got that? Check with your bio buddy, Shadowlands or Sunshine. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 11. Got it? Here's my number. Okay. Whoever, no, it's 11. Ah, it's 11. Whoever is closest, pass or play, explain why this is true. What is this pointing at? Okay. Why is Kirby evolving? Go ahead. Have that discussion. Oh, because a better generation of these games you have more. Like, because, like, an NES is, like, not really that. Dude, bro, this is, like, an NES is back. They're, like, all the bags to one. Small population. All right, so let me help you with your notes. On number four, since it is difficult, and let me tell you something else before I go any farther. What I just taught you just now with those equations, that's AP level. AP level is what level? It's college. Yeah, college level population genetics. You have it though, right? Okay. So since it is difficult not to violate these conditions in a natural population, alleles must be changing. Alleles must be changing and therefore evolution must be occurring. Alleles must be changing and therefore evolution must be occurring. Slate, explain the first thing in the next box where it starts microevolution all the way up before number one. Go ahead, explain what it says there. Uh, 
You guys, the Hardy-Weinberg principle or law was set up to fail, okay? It was set up to fail to show you that evolution does occur because it's too hard to meet those conditions that keep those allele frequencies the same. In fact, one of those things that causes that is mutations, and we've already learned that, okay? So mutations can cause a change in allele frequencies. So on your notes, number one, mutation, a change to the DNA sequence can serve as a source for variation. You, how many of us had blue eyes? 12? You are a mutation. You are a mutant. You are a source of variation. Okay? Another thing is pointer finger. Okay? Migration and gene flow. Movement alleles between populations. Movement of alleles between populations. Okay, what was pinky? What was small the pinky? Population. Yes, the reason why small populations lead to change is because very rapidly you can have that change occur because there's so few members to their population. If a major disease strikes 10 strike, okay, and wipes out 50% of their population, okay, they're gonna be down to around 100 people, right? 100 people and only the alleles within those 100. So when you have a larger population, you can absorb that change a little bit more and you can still increase your variety. Chance has a lot to do with that. One, um, the, when you have like a major disease or a crisis go down, this, this is all called genetic drift. So think about this. Natural selection is more purposeful. The, um, the um, snake with his face on, those that look more like a, a face, those are the ones that survived and reproduced. Genetic drift is just full on randomness. And randomness is more likely in a small population. In this original population here, we have some lavenders, we have some dark green, some light green, you know. And in this case, what would you say, I think I see like four or five colors there. It's not like lavender is the most prevalent, right? But when they go through a bottleneck, some sort of crisis, your eyes are up here, please. When we go through some crisis, which kills off most of them and only a few get through, look at the proportion, 40% of them came through about of just being lavender. So that changed what you had. So a real life example would be if you had brown frogs and you had green frogs. And it just so happened that the brown frogs, uh, a tree fell on them and killed them all wasn't that they were less adaptive, they may have been better adapted. Maybe they could blend in better with their environment. But it just so happened that a tree fell on them. So what are we left with? Green. Green. So all the ensuing populations are going to have be green. That is more likely with you when you have fewer numbers. Genetic drift is more impactful when you have smaller numbers. So on your notes, um, small population size can lead to genetic drift. Changes in the allele frequencies of a gene pool due to um, chance events. Smaller gene pools are impacted, more impacted by drift. The bottleneck effect, it's usually some sort of disaster. Some sort of disaster which wipes out a bunch. The second one I already talked to you about. Slate, tell them what you know. This is founder's effect. Go ahead, talk about it. That is a six-finger dwarf child. Go ahead. Talk about the Amish. Wait, wait, hang on. Let me do that out loud. Just do this for right now, and then we will come back to it. I totally want to hear it. Okay, so bottleneck effect, going through a crisis and only a few survive. That's one way a population can be influenced by genetic drift. The second way you can be influenced by genetic drift is the founder's effect, which says, here's our total population. It's not that we went through a crisis, but a few of us went and started a new colony over here. 
And whatever genes they have, that's what they have to work with. And it just so happened they had more dwarfism and the frequency of dwarfism in six fingers. Here, here's an adult one. Oh, no. Okay. Your band teacher, Mr. Borges, was born with six fingers. I have his baby picture. His mom sent him to me. Now, no, what did, what did he do? He had it surgically removed. His mom did when he was a child. Okay, had it surgically removed. But he has a higher chance, right, depending on how he has his six finger, whether it's a dominant or recessive trait, more than likely a dominant trait, he has a higher incidence of having a what? Six, six finger child. So if for some reason, for some reason, that everybody gets killed in Oak Park except the uh, people in band. So band members, the only ones that survive, okay? And it's for miles. There's no trains, planes, or automobiles. They are isolated in a thousand mile range. Band people, choose your mate, okay? That's all you have. Do you think we're gonna have a higher incidence of six-fingered people? Yes. Okay. All right. Come back to me. So, founder, come back to me. Founder effect. Portion of the population starts a new population with a fraction of the total alleles. With a fraction of the total alleles. So let's come back to me, come back to me. We're talking about evolution. And we're saying evolution is a change in allele frequencies. And we have discussed now, mutations can cause changes in allele frequencies, right? Gene flow can cause changes in allele frequencies. And then we're talking about the pinky right here, genetic drift, because small populations are more prone to genetic drift. You could have a crisis and only a few survive, or you could have some go and start a new colony. Okay, so bottleneck is crisis. Founder's effect is when a few go on and start a new colony for some reason or another. Small populations can drift quite readily. The next one we want to talk about is what? What's the next one on there? Non-random mating. Okay, it's funny because they're lions. Okay, so they, she, she's the she. Okay, the males fight to inseminate the females, and you will have just one or two males in any one group um, pride of lions. And they have fought for that right um, in trussexual selection, right? Fought for that right to breed with the females. So they only want the biggest and the strongest to be mating with them so that their offspring are the what? Biggest, and, biggest the and the strongest. So this is non-random mating. Random mating is if you walked into a bar and said, Anybody want to have sex with me, I'm game, okay? You're not using any selection or choice at all. You're just like, let's have at it, okay? When do people tend to do that? When they what? Drink too much. So stop, don't do that drinking when you turn 21, okay? I want you to be all about the non-random mating. I want you to choose specifically who you start mating with. Right? Okay, that's my mom type. All right, so on your notes, non random mating, one mate is better than another. Okay, and then this leads us to natural selection. Discuss with your bio buddy what has nature selected for the hummingbird here? Discuss with your bio buddy what has nature selected? Why is he adaptive to this environment? With your bio buddy. I uh, feel like it really skinny being sitting in here. And it can flip the wings real fast. I don't know why, but it's too Oh, yeah, it has to be so fast. Oh, and it has to be so fast. Oh, it's like a helicopter. Yeah, it's like So, what is nature selecting? Nature is selecting the, the thumb. And what did the thumb represent? Adaptation, right? Nature is selecting. We saw in the northern climates, it was adaptive to have what? Red hair. Okay, on the equator, not as adaptive. 
right? So nature is selecting what is adaptive for that particular environment. And the premise is, oh, who came up with that idea of natural selection? Darwin, Darwin and also a man named Wallace, but much later, okay? Um, and what it's saying is there are variations among your pop population. Some have red hair, some have brown hair, some have blonde hair. That this is genetic in our DNA, what our hair color is. Some variations are more adaptive than others. In the north, red hair is adaptive, not so at the equator. Um, better adaptive organisms produce more offspring. So if you're in the north and you're healthier because you have more vitamin D, you're the one who's gonna survive and reproduce. If you don't have red hair on the equator, okay, because if you have red hair, you more, more likely could have cancer and decrease your fertility. So it's not as adaptive there. And that you have vast amounts of time. Vast amounts of time. So on your notes, natural selections, you should be able to fill that in. I gave you everything. You are welcome. So now, let's talk, um, let's see, I'm going to pick another number, between 1 and 70, I'm still thinking about it, between 1 and 70. No, I'm kidding. Okay, I have it, are you ready? Is it? It's 13. Okay. Now, whoever is closest to my number, explain using these five steps right here why giraffe nests evolved, why they became longer. Go ahead. Okay, you got it? <laughs> All right, so this was an adaptation to have a longer neck. You already told me because you could get the what? You could get the food from the top, right? Let's look at some adaptations here. What is that? A seal. 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 Okay. So right in your definition of what an adaptation is, it's a trait that helps when it, um, an organism to become to be more suited to its environment. To be more suited to its environment. So let's look at some adaptations. Their heart rate reduces to slow oxygen consumption. Why would they want to reduce oxygen consumption? Because they're mammals, right? They have to go to the surface to breathe. Lungs compress under pressure, reduce spins. Large blood volume to transport and store oxygen. Blubber reduces heat loss. Okay? So these are all adaptations that make them more successful. But what happens if the seal's environment changes? What happens if the water gets warmer? What wouldn't be considered an adaptation anymore? The blubber. the blubber, exactly. Now, who do you think changes the environment faster than any organism on the planet? Humans. Humans. Hence, here's our problem. We can change the environment faster than organisms have a chance to adapt, and that can lead to their extinction. Not always, but it could. Not always, but it could. So that is this last part of this note. 
okay, for today. This is as far as I wanted you to get today. The other part is for another day. This is the very end. When the environment changes, you can have three different results. One, you could increase some members, some increase in some numbers of a species. Okay, do you have that in your notes? Two, you could have an emergence of a new species, and that's called speciation. That'll be for another day. Or three, you could cause extinction. Okay, now, next class, I want to tell you what we're going to do. Um, I, I could have put an end for homework, but because we finished, we, you, I hope you feel comfortable with it. We finished pretty, you know, speedily here. So next class, we don't, what I had scheduled was to finish the notes and then do the lab. But all we'll have to do is do the lab. So the background's really short. And so I think I can just give you 20 minutes at the start of class. You don't have to do it as homework. We'll do the lab, do the analysis, get it all done in class next time. Okay, no homework. So bring your lab notebooks. Because we're going to do it all in one fell swoop. Okay, and that is it for me, my friends. Good job. Have a piece of toast.